So welcome, everybody. Welcome to this session on what have we learned from LGBTQ studies here at Cambridge. I'm Sarah Franklin. I'm the director of the program. And I'm really pleased to have such a great panel here today to talk a little bit about the program, answer your questions, and um, t tell you a bit about what we've learned from this important program here at Cambridge. Um, so to my left is Elizabeth Sandler, who we're really thrilled to have with us as the first funded PhD student in this program. Um, Dr. Robert Prelot, who's a sociologist, who's one of the researchers who's been very active in our program, is gonna talk a little bit about the kind of research we do. Matt Maddox, who's one of the founders of the new LGBTQ plus alumni association and Lord Chris Smith, who is the uh, master of Pemberton and one of the most important members of our management team, as well as our fundraising committee. So we're gonna to talk today about what we've learned from LGBTQ plus here at Cambridge and also um, what's its role in the university going forward. And we're really looking forward to hearing from you. So just to give you a tiny bit of background to start with, this program actually started in 2016. And it started in 2016 as a fundraising initiative to, to get a post in this field. And as some of you may know, there's been a real shortage of new posts following the decline in funding to universities from, from about 2015 onwards. So um, this was the first major post that the Department of Sociology decided to fund in the, to get a chair in LGBTQ studies, which we're still working on. Um, and this is really largely because of the interest from students. Um, students, this is an area many of us started teaching for the first time in around 2015, 2016. And m many of us, myself included, were really quite overwhelmed by student interest in LGBTQ issues and queer theory and trans theory and all the different areas of research that are related to this field. Um, there's a lot of new writing and research in this area. And I, I teach, teach the gender course in sociology and I was really amazed that the very first year this this was taught, um, it was described as the most popular subject um, in the entire paper. Um, we were also really encouraged to start this program because of staff. A uh, number of staff researchers across the university didn't really have a formal research network to be part of. And when we started this program, we were amazed at how quickly it spread across all the disciplines in the School of Humanities and Social Sciences. Um, it also spread across the um, arts, School of Arts and Humanities, and, and Again, somewhat to our surprise, it spread very quickly through the STEM subjects. So today we have coverage across the entire university, across all six schools, across almost all the disciplines, and, and a very substantial representation in colleges too. So these are all the reasons why the program started. And, and, and of course, society plays a major role as well. Um, these issues are increasingly important, along with many other social justice issues, and understanding them is something students know they, they need to know when they go into workplaces where, where, where greater sensitivity around a wide range of issues is now the right thing to do, as well as something that's expected of people. So um, the main thing we've learned from this program is how incredibly popular it is, um, and we are really looking forward to increasing our fundraising in this area and appointing a world leading figure to take this program forward because this is an area where Cambridge can really lead. Um, and this is the panel to tell you about why that's important. So I'm gonna hand over now to Elizabeth and then um, to Robert and to Matt and to Chris. And I just wanna encourage you, um, there's a question function that you can use to ask us questions. So please don't hesitate to start putting questions through. After about 20 minutes, I will start uh, answering questions, but feel free to put them in at any point during our conversation. So let me hand over to you, Elizabeth Sandler. Thank you. I thought I would tell a story. I think everyone likes hearing stories, and as a qualitative researcher, it's my job to share them. Um, but this time it's a more personal story, so normally I tell the stories of others. Today it's my story, and it involves 
to two people. I sit <laughs> in between. <laughs> well, it involves many amazing people, but ma mainly you two. So in 2017, I came to Cambridge uh, to do a second master's in um, the sociology of reproduction. And for you played obviously a major role in creating that amazing program. And Robert was my supervisor. And I wanted to do research uh, with same-sex parents in the UK. And you told me, a bit secretive, you told me <laughs> it's a really good time to do LGBTQ plus studies at Cambridge. And I did not know what you were pointing to it because it wasn't that official yet. But I think it was the Q plus initiative that launched the next year. And you were absolutely right. <laughs> it did really um, change a lot for me. And it is an amazing time to do that research and to do it here. So uh, after I finished my master's, I worked as a research assistant. And then in 2019, I um, was mainly involved in the research for the Outer Cambridge study. And it was a massive privilege of talking to 55 students and staff members here at Cambridge, and so to listen to them, but then also to share what they told me with, at this point, a national and international audience. Because I've had a look at my CV. I think we've had over seven talks, and we had it, like very international audience around it as well. And then of course we had the YouTube videos and I think they're up to a thousand views by now. I just checked this morning. And the report that was sent to other universities as well and circulated within Cambridge. And also based on the Outer Cambridge study, I got funding to continue this work. So the School of Humanities and Social Sciences and Trevor Smith. Um, I think what I'm trying to say here is my becoming as an LGBTQ plus researcher started before I came to Cambridge, so I continued this work. But it was really Cambridge for me that gave me a space to develop these interests. And for me also, it gave me opportunities because of the people. You gave me opportunities to develop and grow as an LGBTQ plus researcher. And I know that, Sarah, you changed my life and you changed the life of many others. I know that because they tell me in interviews. <laughs> I can't tell you all the details, but I know you're changing a lot of lives here and all of you are changing lives. And so I think my personal lesson, what I've learned through my research, but also through my personal experience, is that people can change and create spaces and spaces can change lives. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. And I'll just mention that if people do want to read the report about LGBTQ uh, studies at Cambridge and the difference it makes uh, to people that we have this program here, this is the study that Elizabeth is referring to. It's free to download on our website, which you can also visit. And you can um, sign up to the newsletter. You can watch the YouTube videos. <laughs> and um, you can learn much more about the program there. Yeah. So Robert, over to you. Thank you. Well, wonderful. Um, well, thinking about what I've learned from LGBTQ plus studies at Cambridge, I think th the first thing I've learned is just how many people are out there at Cambridge who do this work. And I I'm not sure if it's specific to Cambridge or universities, but it's often the case that we just don't know about colleagues whose work in one way or another is relevant to our, our own. Um, and I think having something like Q plus really helps people find each other. Um, and it really uh, matters. I think it matters, you know, practically. What it means is that um, there are exciting opportunities for collaboration. So over the past year, colleagues have organised events that uh, really have brought people together, having conversations across disciplinary boundaries. And um, and I think this is what makes academic discussions often more interesting and also give what well, gives them a wider reach. And I think on the, on the individual level as well, I think it really is important for people who do study LGBT issues just to be aware of what those perspectives from other disciplines are uh, so that um, we can make our own work better and more insightful. Probably the second thing I've learned uh, also touches on what has mentioned what, what has been mentioned already, what Sarah talked about, which is um, how much um, we learn from students about LGBT issues as the, as the professional educators, how much we actually find out uh, from students. And I can also <laughs> recall many stories uh, teaching Elizabeth. Um, and I think that applies both to um, current and prospective students. I think uh, there is a, a role that Q Plus or similar initiatives 
um, place in uh, making, helping students realise that LGBT issues might be something worth thinking about or investigating. And I think it also serves the role of sending a kind of signal to people who might be considering continuing education that, uh, well, firstly, Cambridge is the place to study this kind of uh, uh, topic and, and that there's a critical mass of people who uh, provide a suitable environment for um, exploring these kinds of issues. Um, and I think that this all kind of links to uh, this, the, the third and last thing that I want to mention, which is the kind of legitimacy that I think comes with uh, a, a sort of institutionalization of uh, what we can think of LGBT studies. Um, and what I mean by this is really um, the extent to which studying LGBT topics is taken seriously. Um, and, uh, you know, it doesn't necessarily always have to be, you know, a, a good thing, more institutionalization means more visibility, which can also mean, you know, more uh, scope for different kinds of backlash from the outside or from the inside, uh, which is not necessarily helpful for education or knowledge production. But I think generally this kind of legitimacy, le legitimacy or, you know, the wider recognition of what LGBT studies are uh, does help in many ways. And I think, uh, you know, it, can, in me, it, it, it helps in terms of, um, um, in, in, in terms of, I think, you know, um, interactions with colleagues who might not work on these things uh, and I think you know at the very minimum it kind of ensures uh, or you know avoids the possibility of uh, having your own perceived as something that's a bit of a novelty that you kind of always need to explain uh, from the very kind of fundamentals which I think makes people's work easier in many ways professionally um, and uh, and I think it also helps in terms of um, what was the other thing I wanted to say um, it will probably come back to me, but um, I think there is, there is a, you know, something that it does, having an, an initiative like that to, to, to really, uh, you know, communicate more widely uh, what this work does uh, that can be specific to uh, studying LGBT people, but I think also uh, finding space for a different kinds of analysis that can say something more general. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Robert. Yep. And Robert is wearing, um, as am I, and not our very special lanyard. Um, and if there are any alumni who would like a um, Cambridge LGBTQ lanyard and be part of our wider community, you should um, drop us an email and we'll pop one in the post. Yep. Matt, over to you. Uh, thank you. Um, and maybe start with just a little background to the um, Alumni Society. And I think we, we started um, in 2018-2019, um, completely independently of the, um, uh, at that time, of, of the Q uh, Plus programme. And I think we really set it up for, with kind of two main objectives. The first one was to just, you know, a typical support network for, you know, LGBTQ plus um, individuals in the workplace. Um, a lot, there, there are a lot of other similar org uh, organisations within, within companies or within industries, but, you know, we wanted to to, to set up for those purposes. But I think the, the, the main reason was that as a group um, uh, of people, uh, as, in a sort of, as a university alumni group, we, we sort of recognised that we'd be cross industries, cross sectors. Uh, we would come from lots of different backgrounds, lots of different professional experiences. And that would really help to sort of promote best practice, and, and really try and create a, a sort of a stronger and more powerful voice um, in the workplace by bringing together some of the, um, some of the different uh, experiences um, and work that's being done across, across different industries. So that, that sort of seems um, like we, we could be and should be a very powerful advocate. Um, and also, you know, for, for, for myself and the friends that, that set it up, we are now sort of at a... Uh, at a place in life where we we can we can really sort of be influential um, in in the workplace and um, uh, and across industry. So it seemed a really um, uh, it seemed the right thing to do to sort of set up a, an alumni network. And we were we were very surprised that one did not exist. <laughs> um, so our, our first conversation was let's get in contact with the alumni society, um, and there were it. it uh, they were incredibly supportive of, of, of setting up the group, but it was not a typical um, alumni group, which were generally much more focused on something more specific, whether it was a territory or a profession or so. Um, uh, but we, we had lots of support, and 
we were then introduced to the, to the Q Plus program. Um, again, sort of coincidentally, I think. Um, and I think there are two, there are, there are a couple of really powerful areas um, that we can work um, with the Q Plus um, program or, and work with kind of current university students. The first one is we know that that, that movement from academia into the workplace is, is problematic. Uh, for some people it can be traumatic, it can, you know, there is, a, there is the percentage of people um, going sort of effectively back in the closet or, or hiding their, uh, their identity is, is way too high, you know, it's just, that's just not acceptable. Um, and that uh, academic sort of professional link, we can help um, to, to address that. Uh, and the second thing is the research that you do really gives us um, a sort of a, a, a business case or a, um, some intellectual rigour as to why the, the work we're trying to do is important, um, what we should be doing, what we can be doing, um, and really help to justify the things that, that we're often saying in the workplace, which we know are true, which we know um, are the right thing to do, but often as LGBTQ people, we are asked to justify or provide some kind of um, uh, uh, support or, or research or evidence um, for those changes. Um, so I think that's, um, those are really the areas that are, I think, are wonderfully valuable to us and, and the alumni network. I mean, we've really valued working with you and we've workshopped the report with you and um, I think the University of the Future is going to have a lot more crossover around learning, education, employment um, in various areas, including this one. Yeah, thanks so much. So Chris, over to you. Um, I was uh, thinking as I, uh, uh, as I pondered about uh, uh, the discussion that uh, we're having, I was thinking, why is uh, having LGBTQ plus um, uh, studies at a really significant university like Cambridge important? Why is it worth doing? Um, and uh, I, I think there are two things primarily, I would say. Firstly, it's important in and for itself because um, uh, LGBTQ is part of the intellectual history and discourse. Uh, it's part of the pattern of social issues that any university has to address and analyze and research and think about and discuss. And um, I, uh, there's, a, there's a wonderful speech in um, uh, Larry Kramer's The Normal Heart, which is uh, a play about um, the AIDS crisis in, uh, uh, in the 1980s. Um, and the character, who's a, a, a gay character, says, I come from a culture that includes Plato and Socrates and Dostoevsky and Tchaikovsky and Walt Whitman and James Baldwin and John Maynard Keynes and E.M. Forster. And actually, if you want to know why LGBTQ studies and the history of uh, LGBTQ impact on life, on thought, um, on the way in which we all think and, uh, 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 and talk, uh, it, it, it is self-evidently important that we consider this. So the, the, the first reason why it's important is uh, that it is dealing with important stuff and, um, uh, and a university needs to do that. The second thing uh, that uh, why I think this is uh, is really important, um, and uh, I'm I'm thinking back to uh, the days of the late 90s and the 2000s um, when I was in Parliament. Uh, I was um, uh, uh, the first openly gay MP in um, uh, in the country, and um, one of the things that uh, really struck me was that the political and legislative process, progress that we made in the course of the late 90s and the 2000s um, wasn't because 
political parties had made decisions. And it wasn't just that politicians had decided to come out and, uh, and, and devote uh, energy to this issue. It was actually made possible because hundreds of thousands of people in their workplace, in their neighborhood, in their family, amongst their friends, had felt that it was possible for them to say, yes, I am LGBTQ. And, uh, and that transformed social attitudes. Mm. And it was because of the transformation of social attitudes that then political and legislative pro progress was able to be made. And I think in a university, having dedicated LGBTQ studies having it as an important and respected part of the curriculum helps to emphasize the normality of being LGBTQ. Yeah. And that gives students real confidence that they can be themselves, that they can be confident about being themselves. And that will enormously, whatever subject they're studying, it will enormously benefit their ability to study and to develop. Yeah, that's really beautifully, beautifully said. Thank you so much for those comments. And there's such an interest now in AIDS activism and going back to what was learned in the 1980s um, about the difference it makes to work collectively to change consciousness and to bring about social change by, as you say, opening up a space that didn't exist. Um, universities, I think, have seized upon this area in no small part because it represents that principle so generally. So we do have some um, questions here. They're kind of microscopic, so I might need to, <laughs> excuse, excuse me while I <laughs> lean down to decipher the, the questions. Um, and um, so this is um, three different questions about same-sex parenting. Fortunately, we have one of Cambridge's leading experts um, on that here. Um, are there any, and I think this might be three questions from the same person who's undoubtedly a Cambridge graduate because they have, um, have asked three questions in a row. Um, so are there any studies on the quality of parenting by sons of lesbian mothers? Um, studies that explore surrogate mothers um, with infertile or older lesbian commissioning mothers, and um, to what extent is it necessary to separate out some of the characteristics in the overall LGBTQ acronym? Okay, so that's actually a different question. Um, so let's take those first two questions. These are about research that's been done on um, lesbian families and um, alternative ways of parenting um, mm -hmm. with surrogates from LGBTQ. Do you want to address that, Robert? Sure, yes. Um, thank you for the question. So if I understood correctly from the beginning uh, of the question, the question was about the quality of parenting of sons. Right. So, um, I mean, I think and a very important thing to say is that Susan, Professor Susan Gollenbach here at, at Cambridge um, is one of the leading researchers in this area and has done quite a bit of research on lesbian and gay families. And actually her research has been instrumental in changing the law on this, which is another thing we've learned from this area that very high quality research will make a real difference. I do not know whether Susan or anyone else's research has looked at how sons mm -hmm. of lesbian parents yes. parent Right. It's a really good question. It is, it is I would, very I would, I would, I would say probably really well, but um, <laughs> let's let's see what the data says. Yes. Do you know? Do uh, you know? This, is, is it, it is a really good question, and I think uh, people like Susan, who as Sarah highlighted, uh, has has done such great work that has really had such a huge impact in how society at large thinks about parenting by same-sex couples, um, and are still doing very important work that really um, carefully. Uh, documents the you know, newer and newer forms of families that are being created. And I think the question of children who are raised by uh, same-sex parents, um, th these are probably the kind of questions that have begun to be asked a little bit more, more, more recently. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and I think 
in terms of quality of parenting, um, certainly uh, psychological research probably provides a lot of insights into um, the, 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 the kind of details of what might be uh, the different similarities and differences. Um, but I think uh, what, what basically this body of work often shows is that regardless of the particular composition of families, the particular structure uh, of those families, it is the quality of, of, of parenting that matters. And I think in terms of children being raised by uh, same-sex parents, I think there's also this kind of added appreciation of growing up in a particular environment where from the early age you are being used to um, growing in some, some sort of way, environment that's different from what most other families around you is, I think it often, uh, I would imagine, gives those adult children also an appreciation of how to um, deal with raising kids uh, in a way that uh, makes them feel more included and more um, able to form um, you know, diff different kinds of relationships that perhaps also more reflective about how to deal with different kinds of adversity um, that undoubtedly still um, they are likely to encounter in one way or another, whether it's schools or, or, the, or other kinds of institutions. So I think it will be really interesting now to see, you know, in term, to think in terms of generations um, about what it really is that, uh, you know, those families have to offer on the one hand and, you know, the challenges that they have to face um, when there is no longer necessarily this kind of assumption that, uh, uh, you know, it's just, a, you know, the, the sexual orientation or, or gender identity of parents that has some kind of impact on the wider family, but also um, the generations that preceded it, which are not necessarily uh, heterosexual parent families. So uh, it's some, certainly something to look forward to finding more about. Yeah. May I add one sentence? To that? Um, actually, I'm going to come to you with the next question. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, um, if you don't mind. No. Yeah. Um, I mean, um, there's a huge amount of research in this area now. I think this has to be one of the major areas of research on the family and social psychology um, at the moment. Um, social psychology often looks at measuring outcomes. There would be other disciplines that would look in a more interpretive way at what's the family mean, how are definitions of family changing. Um, it's certainly one of the major forms of social change of the 21st century that both lesbian and gay um, marriage and lesbian and gay families have been so normalized. I, I would not personally, as a pre-Stonewall individual, have thought that would happen so quickly, but it certainly has. So this question, Elizabeth, is um, asking about what you said about your original study of same-sex parenting. To what extent, the questioner wants to know, is it necessary to separate out, out some of the characteristics in the overall LGBTQ plus acronym to be able to study specific issues in the context of same-sex parenting. So mm. yeah, the L and the G and the... Yeah, yeah. Um, what, what, what is the... You're a very good person to ask that question, Elizabeth. Well, thank you. <laughs> I try my best to live up to that <laughs> expectation now. Um, I think it's a really important question to ask generally, not just on same-sex parenting, but within the massively broad area of LGBTQ plus studies in general, because obviously the, the acronym is compri comprises different identity aspects, but not all refer to the same identity aspect. So of course we have sexuality, um, we also have gender, we have certain aspects about the biological body in how the biological sex is understood in that sense. And with more and more letters being added, we have more complexity and nuance also to these overall um, areas. And so obviously these will play out differently on a day-to-day -day basis and also for certain tasks and behaviors such as parenting or not. It also positions us differently towards others. So I think very great question to ask in general. I'm now thinking back um, to the two studies I've done on same-sex parenting specifically in the UK. I remember, I, know, I don't know if you remember, but I remember I wanted to have that diversity and complexity within my sample, so within the group of people I spoke to. But interestingly enough, I then called it same-sex parenting 
because only a certain amount of people reached out to me and it was specifically female same-sex identifying parents within the UK. They were all highly educated and in terms of social class status very well off and so they identified as cis female um, and they identified all as mothers and mainly I think as lesbians which is so interesting in itself I think to see who reaches out to a very broad request to participate and to have their stories heard, right? Um, so again, I can only speak on these very specific aspects. Um, so in terms of the questions, the importance of... Separating, separating out the different out, yeah, yeah, yeah. trans issues from LGBT right. issues. Yeah. I mean... I vaguely remember because it's been a, a, it's been a while, um, but the parents did acknowledge also the differences to other members of the community and that's kind of a pattern that is apparent in all the studies I've been doing. So obviously there's some sense of awareness um, of varying degrees of, well, privilege, but then also um, transphobia, homophobia, that some are better off than others and some are more impacted than others because in some of these letters we are further ahead than, than other ones. So there was this acknowledgement. I think all of the parents I worked with, they had really good experiences um, that was within broader, bigger cities as well. So I think there's something to consider here as well but they had really good experiences mainly and it was really important to spend time equal time with their children to kind of become visible as parents to themselves in their identity as parents so that's one of the main findings but they were doing well but then obviously we have a lot of other studies that say there's so much m more way to go and more research to do with other subgroups, especially also to create this visibility awareness, to diversify the knowledge we do have about the LGBTQ plus community, and to use research as a form of activism to sensitize the population about, as you said, Chris, the normality of that, but also the importance and still the stigmatization that's going on. Yeah, um, it's, it's so interesting that the breakthrough series for Netflix was trans parent, um, this is clearly an issue that's really affected how people think about families and relationships and also about identity and about themselves and about the course of a lifetime and how things change. And I think it comes back to what you said, Chris, it's, it's, it's a series that's all about opening up a space that didn't really exist before. And this must be quite a significant issue in the alumni um, network where um, increasing numbers of LGBTQ parents can actually exchange experiences and <laughs> exchange logistical <laughs> suggestions. And do you maybe want to say a bit about that aspect of the network, perhaps? Yeah, I mean, I think I think this is a, a perfect example of um, of the kind of research that um, organisations are looking for. You know, that really good companies will just say, "Tell us how do we support." Um, our employees, you know, how do we support um, gay parents, how do we support trans parents, how do we support adoption, surrogacy, other, other roots to family, you know, they just want to know, they want someone to tell them. And, you know, these companies don't, won't always have someone that identifies as that within their organisation that is going through a, a parenting journey. So some companies will um, sort of develop with an individual and they will build the policies needed to support um, a particular employee, but I think what, what is much more powerful is to go with them and say, this is how you train, <laughs> you know, this is how you can support parenting, this is why, you know, the parenting journey is different, this is why the, the routes to parenthood are different, um, and, and, and this is, this is really um, uh, what it's like for, for those employees or potential employees going through that. I think it's, a, it, it, it's exactly the sort of research that um, needs to be making its way um, into um, into business, into into you mm. know, in, into the professional yeah. world. Um. And uh, just picking up from that, I think one of the really interesting things, one of the big social changes of the last four or five years, has been the way in which uh, the business world, many companies, many uh, organisations, um, have have really taken on the 
the need for inclusivity uh, for their workforce. And uh, they want to do the right thing. They want to know how they can best provide the best kind of support for the people who work for yeah. them. This is where research, whether it's on parenting or whether it's on other aspects of being LGBTQ, um, where research can really help. Yeah. Because there's a hunger out there in the business world for knowing what the best ways they can help actually are. Yeah. And I think, you know, it, it sends such a strong signal when a company does that and when it does it in a genuine way, not just in a kind of don't complain about it way. Um, and it sends a signal to everybody, you know, not just to LGBTQ people, but to everyone that th this is a workplace where diversity is valued. This is a workplace where we want to hear from you, what's going to make your work experience more successful. and. And that has become a kind of symbol of change and the kind of change that people want to see. Um, I, I think uh, we were so surprised, another thing we learned from our program, how popular these lanyards are. And we, we, we distributed over 1,000 um, 10,000 years ago when we, when we were all here <laughs> on campus. Um, and and um, I have like another 1,000 in my office that I'm sure is going to go um, like wildflower when we reconvene here, but I, I think what's really important about the lanyard, which I didn't ever realize would be so important to people, is that it's ordinary. You know, it's just an ordinary thing. Everybody wears it, the porters wear it, the staff wear it, the students wear it, you know, people who are LGBTQ, people who aren't. It doesn't really matter. What it says is, as like an outstretched hand, what it says is a kind of welcome. What it says is we are encouraging a diverse, community, we value a diverse community. That message has become such an important message um, today. So this next question is interesting because the question is about the interface between autism and girls and LGBTQ identities. Um, and it says here, because the tie-in is quite high. Um, and that, of course, raises the link between the LGBTQ um, movement, um, LGBTQ sensitivity, and sensitivity around mental health. Um, and one of the very interesting um, trends I've seen in a lot of professional uh, organizations is the link between tolerance of neurodiversity, um, even that word neurodiversity, um, mental health, and inclusivity. Um, and it's interesting that the Wellcome Trust, which is one of the largest medical funding um, charities here in the UK, I think the second largest one in the world, um, has made mental health one of their top priorities. I think COVID, in the way it's been such a reveal of so many things, has really revealed how much kind of hidden mental health distress there is and what a huge difference it makes to take that out of the closet, as it were, and to allow that to become something we talk about in the workplace openly. So I don't know if that's something people might have some thoughts on. Um, again, yeah, go there's, ahead, Elizabeth. There's also research on coming out as now that transcends the LGBTQ plus identity and experience. And I know because I've spent a lot of hours, many hours, systematically categorizing over 700 publications over the last 50 years in 30 disciplines, which will be published soon. So what has the term coming out been linked to? And more and more, I think it just speaks the adaptation. Yes, it's also problematic. That's a different story, but it also kind of shows uh, a, a bigger awareness and also a value in a sense, kind of a refusal of restrictions and discrimination, a changing of the narrative in an empowering way, um, but then also an appreciation, acknowledgement, an identity category of diversity, whatever that is. Um, that was just my thought yeah. to throw it in. Yeah. Any other comments from anybody? Yeah. Um, I think we'll see a lot more um, attention to mental health, which is traditionally a very stigmatized area, um, as it too comes to be reinterpreted as something that can have very positive implications, not just um, not just um, not just individual difficulties, but a creativity and ability to 
think differently, a way of seeing things that is sensitive in ways that um, are not necessarily mainstream, but, but, are, but, are, but are all the more valuable in some ways because of that. Mm -hmm. I don't think this answers the question exactly, but I hope that's helpful. Um, so I think we have about 10 minutes left, so if there's any more questions, please do let us know. And I'd, I'd, I just want to maybe tell one small anecdote, um, which is that I was recently in touch with the um, owners of the shop, which I'm sure you're all aware of, Gaze the Word, on Marchmont Street, because um, I get my hair cut right next to <laughs> Gaze the Word, so I was there the other day, and uh, highly recommend Bebus next to Gaze the Word. Probably not supposed to do that, but anyway. Um, and, um, you know, I was chatting to them, says, how's it going? How's business going? And they're like, well, you know, business is absolutely through the roof. Mm. Uh, so, so interesting, because, you know, many parts of London now are much quieter, especially on a Friday. Um, and um, they said there's a huge interest in books. This is something we're seeing reported a lot. Uh, independent bookstores doing much better, and in particular, in books, memoirs, writings about the 1980s, about Clause 28, about AIDS activism. Um, some of you may be familiar with Sarah Shulman's new book, Let the Record Show, which is a huge compendium uh, about AIDS activism in the um, 1980s. And they said that during COVID, a lot of the reading groups that were set up became very important to people, and as soon as they could, they wanted to go by the books, and of course, Gaze the Word sells a lot of used books as well as newer books. So, so I was very, very interested in that phenomenon, and I thought, what an interesting development in the age when, you know, we might think everybody's just watching Netflix now, but, <laughs> but no, they're going to small independent bookstores, and that one in particular, which is now what I think maybe it, it is, uh, 40 years old. It, it is one of the really hopeful um, mm. uh, phenomena of... Uh, uh, of, of, of now, um, if, if people are becoming attached to the physical book <laughs> and, uh, and actually reading it, 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 it's actually something rather wonderful. Yeah. And uh, it is, it's worth just reflecting for a moment, Gaze the Word is, is a very good um, uh, monitor of how things have changed. Uh, because I can remember back in the early 1980s, uh, when Customs and Excise raided Gaze the Word bookshop um, and impounded a whole um, series of books uh, and effectively closed them down for a while um, uh, because they uh, thought that importing books about uh, LGBTQ lives um, was somehow pernicious. Yeah. Um, now, thank goodness, we have moved on a huge distance from mm -hmm. there, uh, but we should never forget um, that it's very easy to slip back mm -hmm. to that yeah. sort of, uh, yeah. of world. And um, uh, the more that we we study and analyze and think about LGBTQ studies, um, the more protected we will be against the possibility of sliding back. Yeah, yeah, I agree. It's very much a model of how to incorporate research into political activism um, and into organizing and into science. Um, many of the things that happened during the period of AIDS activism were about changing the definition of what the relationship between scientific research and society could be, um, which is, of course, a very important lesson for us today in the context of, of the pandemic. Um, do you want to say a little bit, Matt, about some directions the alumni group might be taking going forward? Because I know there's a lot of interest in resuming in-person events, and I thought it might be helpful for people to know what, what's on the horizon. Yeah, so I think, you know, kind of touch, touching on your point a little bit, I think people do want to get back um, to those in-person um, and events. I think it's particularly um, important for LGBTQ plus people, but also other, other sort of uh, 
minority groups that in the sort of post-lockdown world, maybe we aren't going to be the first ones going back to the office. Maybe we, we have, you know, reasons or reservations and that, you know, that, that, that workplace maybe is not as safe. And again, this is one of the, I think one of the reasons why we have to push forward these events, but also have some you know, sort of rigorous understanding of the changing dynamic of the workplace. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, to talking about why we need these kind of studies, we need it to keep going. You know, we don't just need uh, uh, some research done in, in 2020 and then that, you know, we, we, we're done and we understand it because the landscape is constantly evolving and it can so easily go backwards. You know, in a, in, in a post-lockdown world, the lived experiences of, of LGBTQ plus employees could deteriorate over, say, 2018 because, you know, this, this flexibility in the new way of working may actually disadvantage people. Um, it may favour, and I think we will see, it will favour um, groups that already have um, privilege. Um, so we're definitely going to be uh, pushing ahead and try and do more in-person events, encouraging people to come out into the workplace, encouraging the networks that we all belong to um, to, get, um, to get back um, to that kind of uh, uh, sort of safe spaces, but also giving people the confidence to return um, and to remember, you know, <laughs> that we do have to keep moving um, forward with this work. Mm. So, yeah, so we're going to try and uh, yeah, do, some, do some events, probably in Cambridge, um, maybe in London, um, yeah. some other areas where we have, because I think, I think LGBTQ people understand the importance of, of those sort of uh, in-person meetings, the safe space it creates, mm. but I think it's also really important that the wider... <laughs> The wider uh, workplace or the wider communities understand why they're particularly relevant and particularly uh, critical to to LGBT experiences. Yeah, and you have a web page now on the um, Cambridge alumni site. Yes, um, and you have another web page. The LinkedIn you're... is probably the best way to connect with us. And LinkedIn is the other one. Yeah. yeah. So okay. LinkedIn good. Is, LinkedIn is you can you can email. We will get an email from the um, alumni site. Um, but the best place to engage the community is, is, is on LinkedIn now. Yeah. Um, and I... and uh, one of the things I hope may be able to emerge from the, <clears throat> the networking of alumni uh, is perhaps some help and support and advice for current students. Yes. Um, who, uh, who, who, who may be thinking about what the future holds for them, how they make their way in the world, uh, what the challenges they may be going to face are, and um, a, a bit of you know, this is what it was like for us. Uh, kind of discussion mm -hmm. uh, can, I think, potentially yeah. be very helpful. Well, it's worth saying that um, one of the main recommendations of the report was to uh, raise the profile of LGBTQ within all of the colleges. And we are now engaged in an effort, you and I are both very engaged in this effort, to get more colleges to put more information on their webpage and to have a tab. It's an LGBTQ tab, and if possible, to have a LGBTQ rep who's a fellow, um, which I think has been initiated for the first time by um, St. Catherine's uh, College. and and um, it's definitely something the students are very keen to see. Um, they're very keen to see this um, raised as an issue more prominently, more visibly, not hugely more visibly, but a bit more visibly in the colleges. And COVID has really reinforced that, that the sense that the college community cares about inclusivity and about diversity and about hearing people um, has definitely risen on the agenda, so definitely we'll be seeing a lot more of that. So if people want to get involved um, through your college, um, through your uh, former department, um, through the Q Plus program, you should definitely come to our webpage, sign up, um, sign up for the alumni network and send us communication, send us emails about what you're doing, um, what, what issues you're interested in, and um, feel free to come along to our events. A lot of them are recorded so you can, 
can attend them virtually, um, and hopefully more of them will be in person this year as well. Any other closing comments from anybody? Yep. Okay, well, I think we're pretty much out of time. We're winding up. We're getting the nod from the <laughs> back of the room, which I think means the clock is ticking down to the end. So I think we'll say thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming, and goodbye. Bye. Bye. <laughs>